This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Is DeAndre Levy going to pull a Calvin 2.0? It's time to know our foes. The Chicago Bears will take a look at today, as well as more draft goodness here on the Hindsight 20. This is the Hindsight 20 Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Mallory. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening. As always, proud member of the Detroit Sports Podcast Network, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. We're up and coming. We're here. We're current. We're hip. We're now. Any other cool adjective you want to accompany with us, feel free to do so. It's not just myself. It's Doc and Jock. It's Fantasy Geeks. Tigers Talk. Listen, guys. Opening day, it's right here. You can smell the overpriced hot dogs from Comerica as we speak. So there's plenty here on the Detroit Sports Podcast to talk about. I am one small yet very proud piece giving you the greatest, the best, or maybe just the mildly entertaining in terms of the Detroit Lions. Today's show, we've got a couple of things to talk about. Like I said, we're going to start off with DeAndre Levy. Is he kind of bracing us for Calvin 2.0? We'll get into that. We're going to have a new segment called Know Your Fault. It's all about the division. Um, the playoffs in the NFL, yeah, wild card is nice, but you're playing to win your division. So in the next three weeks, we're going to take a different team. This week is the Chicago Bears. Then we'll do the Green Bay Packers and the Minnesota Vikings. We've got some draft goodness to talk about. I've got some sleepers for you, and we'll tackle a few questions as well as a little segment that we'll be doing for the next uh, few weeks. Maybe not every week, but here and there. Life without Calvin, a different aspect. How we'll adjust, you know, predicting what players will do, if we'll struggle, if we'll succeed in other areas. And so we'll do that as well. DeAndre Levy, I mean, this guy is already different, okay? And uh, my compadres at PrideDetroit.com, they talked about this beautifully on their podcast. If you don't listen to them, do yourself a favor, go over there. I join them occasionally. Uh, I like to join a little bit more. My schedule hopefully will be clearing up so I can do just that. PrivateTrade.com, a proud member of that website as well, giving you video contribution as well as the podcast. So I wasn't on this week, but uh, Chris Lemieux and the boys uh, touched on this, and uh, I'm going to give you long form. If you want to hear more about it, go over there and check them out. But we've all heard DeAndre Levy, right? Um, He's a different guy to start off with. We know that. Not saying it's a bad thing or a good thing. It's just a thing. He's a different guy. You know, he's bathing in sulfuric volcano acid. He's uh, a wing walker. You know, on the wings of planes, he likes to skydive. He likes to go. I mean, he likes to go weird in different places. It's cool. He's young. He's living his life up. He's not just traditional, stereotypical young athlete where it's all about, you know, flash and money and women. Hey, I'm sure all of that is a part of his equation in some form or another. But it seems as though he's loving life. He's living it to the full. But he's definitely different. And so he's come out kind of bashing the NFL. In terms of their uh, their caution to the young ones, their uh, methods in terms of the injuries, the potential damage that an NFL player can receive from CTE and the list goes on and on. He's been very vocal being anti-NFL and the way they've approached things as a whole. And if you read between the lines, some of these things and the way he's talking it makes it seem like, you know, he might be the next one to pull a Calvin. He might be the next one to say, Hey, I've had a, my a fair share of injuries. I don't want to end up like my buddy Javid Best. I don't want to end up like Calvin, who's still relatively healthy. Let me get out as soon as I can. You know, he uh, he made a quick statement saying he's looking forward for the upcoming season, ready to give it his all. He's on he's on retirement watch. I mean, you have to honestly say that DeAndre Levy is on retirement watch, and it would really suck if he were to leave next year because that would be three straight off seasons where you've lost arguably three of their best five players. You know, Sue, who I thought was the best player on the team, really, talent-wise. Calvin, who many thought or think was the best player on the team. And then Levy, like I said, in that top five. But the guy's got to do what he's got to do. You know, um, for selfishly, you want all these guys to stay on the team, to play for little to no money, to uh, put their bodies on the line. We don't want to see anyone get hurt. But, you know, selfishly, we want all these guys to stay, right? But if a man's got to go, he's got to go. Reading in between the lines, though, with Levy, it's like, 
you know, especially his priorities are similarly be a little bit different. He loves to travel. He loves to be a man of the world. Doesn't seem like he's too tied in to just what your average NFL player maybe would be at his age. And the comments he's made the last few weeks being super critical of the NFL and the way they approach things in terms of these injuries, CTE, et cetera, et cetera. Levy could be the next Calvin 2.0, calling it quits, hanging them up. He's got a few more years left on this contract. He just signed this contract. Um, I guess a smart podcaster, as I was doing my show prep, I've got notes. See, listen, that's the sound of paper. Uh, One thing I did not jot down was the remaining years on his contract. I want to say he signed a four or five year deal. One year is already gone. So he's got three or four more years left. Will he ride that out and then ride off to the sunset? I mean, he's literally done the horseback riding deal. Will he climb up on that horse and fade away after that? Well, hey, if you can get three more years out of him, that's good. He's officially on retirement watch. Calvin Johnson 2.0 watch would not be surprised if at the end of this upcoming year, he's calling it quits. It's such a trend now that it's not even a trend. It's just something that we're going to see as a norm. Guys getting out, um, you know, late 20s, early 30s, money left to get, gas left in the tank. But for several reasons, primarily injury, concerns, um, maybe they've been injured too much. Maybe they don't want to be injured too much. Calling it quits. Levy's on Calvin 2.0 watch. Hopefully, you know, I'm wrong about that, but we'll have to just wait and see. Speaking of big Calvin, let's get into this segment that I just mentioned. It's called Life Without Calvin. I'll be attacking this several different ways. Um, this week, we're going to look at that short stretch in 2014 when Matt Stafford and Golden Tate were the, the one-two combo. Uh, it was a three-game stretch. Um, games huh, six, I had to think about that. Game six, seven, and eight. That's the three game stretch. Uh, game six against Minnesota, then you had New Orleans, and then, yes, the one over in London against the Atlanta Falcons. Now, we went three and on those games, and uh, Calvin was hurt. He got hurt uh, previously, the Green Bay game, he got a little banged up. Then against uh, Buffalo, it got even worse. Didn't play those next three weeks. So, how did our boys do? I mean, this, it's a small glimpse of what our offense may look like because literally he was not on the field. Now, when I tackle this topic, the succeeding weeks, I'll look at this a number of different ways, not just how the Lions have done without Calvin, how other NFL quarterbacks have done losing a monumental receiver. Let's see uh, what Dante Culpepper did after losing Randy Moss. Let's see what Donovan McNabb did after losing Terrell Owens. We'll go into it from that angle and a number of other ones. Today's segment of Life Without Calvin, though, we are looking strictly at that three-game stretch. Like I said, games six, seven, and eight. Then there was a bye week. Then Calvin returned against the Miami Dolphins. But uh, let's see how we did. Now, record-wise, we went three and no. You got to keep in mind about 2014, the defense was one of the best. Definitely in Lions history, one of the best run defenses in the last 20 years. And so even without Calvin or with Calvin, we weren't scoring a ton of points. Our offense weren't. Uh, wasn't, excuse me, willing us to tons of wins. I mean, the offense looked great against the New York Giants. Remember that? Monday Night Football, Calvin with two touchdowns, you know, Caldwell's first game, whole new regime. It's like, man, this this looks great. Well, I think someone told them to play good offense for one game and then stop. Perhaps they forgot how to play good offense after that one game. I don't know. Um, the issues with Lombardi certainly did not come after game one. But games 2 through 16, yeah, we heard it, we saw it, and we lived it. And uh, let's look and see, though, how Matthew Stafford and Golden Tate did in those three games. So for Stafford, you got Minnesota. He went uh, 19 for 33 for 185 yards, one touchdown, and no interceptions. It was a win. The defense willed us. It was 17 to 3, and uh, Stafford didn't look that good. Keep in mind, Minnesota is a pretty good defense. They were good last year, good year before that. The next game against New Orleans, it was a victory. Uh, a little bit more in terms of passing yards and touchdowns. Completion percentage, not you know as good as you would like, but it was kind of indicative of his percentage that whole year. You know, in the 50, 55 to 60-ish range, he really got it up this past season. That's what she said. Uh, he went 27 for 40 for 299 yards, two touchdowns, and two interceptions. Uh, that was the comeback game. Golden Tate was huge. We're going to get to his stats in just a second. And, um, you know, the offense, when it needed to, got some key first downs and touchdowns 
to get that victory. Then it was the big one, uh, Big Ben in London against Atlanta. Oh, man, that game was so much fun. I remember uh, watching that game early, and um, it was like 9.30 game, or I don't remember exactly what time it came on, but it came on early. I had to leave, go into my meeting, my place of worship, and I'm listening to the last few seconds on the radio, and uh, oh, it was so dramatic. We all remember that. One of the one of the more fun experiences. I wish uh, I taped my reaction when that field goal went in. I went absolutely crazy. Uh, Mrs. Jerry Mallory, uh, kind enough to drive because she knew, and she's a huge Lions fan as well. So, you know, she's a nervous wreck. I'm a nervous wreck. I may be slightly a little bit more nervous. And when that field goal went in and, you know, we won that game, I went crazy. So how did Stafford do? He was 24 for 47 in that game, 325 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. In summary, his stats a little up, a little down, a little shaky, but overall decent, kind of indicative of what he did with Calvin Johnson there the whole year. And so, you know, it looked as though we didn't miss him. And it's not that simple. I I realize that it's never that cut and dry where, oh, if his stats look the same without him, then, you know, you you lose him forever. And it's going to, I know it's not that simple, but, you know, when you see the huge contrast, like, Let's say in those three games, Stafford went 10 for 25 and had five interceptions. Then it's kind of like, yeah, uh, not having Calvin is going to hurt just a little bit more than we have ever wanted to admit to, more than we ever anticipated or hope to realize. And that wasn't the case just based on those three games. You know, like I said, Stafford looked about the same in those three games without Calvin as he did with Megatron in 2014. Now, Golden Tate, it's promising. You get to see that with an expanded role, with more targets, with a bigger opportunity, a chance to be a number one receiver, which, you know, he's in that mix, him and Marvin Jones, kind of one and one A, or one A and one B, however you want to put it. Well, that first game, it was slow. Seven catches, 44 yards against Minnesota. Then those next two games is where uh, we saw go and take pop. Ten catches, 151 yards, and a touchdown against New Orleans. Seven catches, 151 yards, and a touchdown against the Atlanta Falcons. This tells me that with an expanded opportunity, and both of these defenses were like subpar, both New Orleans and Atlanta. I get that. However, you know, we will be playing subpar defenses next year, and we will have opportunities for Golden Tate uh, to exploit mismatches. It happens all throughout the year. To me, he, he stepped up to the to the plate, okay? When it was time for him to come in and be the number one guy, he looked the part, he was ready, and he showed out. Now, the cool thing about this year, that's going to be a little bit different. Now, that year, you had Golden Tate, and then you had, you know, the guys under him, whatever. It's a little bit different now. It's uh, two two years removed from Ebron. Now, he was a rookie in those years, and now here he is in his third season. He improved in 2015. We're expecting him and hoping him to improve in 2016. So you have an improved Eric Ebron at your side. The same can be said for Theo Reddick. You know, Reddick was was still pretty good in 2014. Got even better in 2015. 2016, we're hoping to see more of the same, possibly slightly better. Um, at the very least, we're expecting Reddick to be as good as he was in 2015, which was an increase from that year in 14 when Tate had those numbers. Then you add Marvin Jones. Marvin Jones could very well be the number one receiver on this team. Like I said, him and Tate are going to be going back and forth. and so. Life without Calvin in 2014, it was it was sudden. We weren't prepared. You know, we built everything around having him on our team. Life without Calvin 2016 is different. We've got guys that are a little bit older now, ready to step up. We brought in a decent replacement. Can't replace Calvin, but a, a really good player in Marvin Jones. Jim Bob Cooter, no doubt. The scheme and the 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 reads and the things in which he'll construe, knowing we won't have Calvin will be a lot different. As same as the chemistry and the timing and uh, that bond that Matthew Stafford had with Calvin, he's starting to build that with other guys. I want to see him and Marvin Jones go to Atlanta and throw the football around a little bit. I'm sure him and Tate will hook up a little bit more, and we still don't know what we'll do uh, for the draft and free agency. Uh, Life without Calvin in 2014 was like Golden Tate and a lot of question marks. Life without Calvin 2016 is Golden Tate. Marvin Jones, Theo Reddick, an improved Eric Ebron, and we'll go from there. You know, 
even as far as Jeremy Curley being the, the third or fourth receiver as an upgrade to whatever we had at that point. Was Chris Durham still around in 2014? You tell me. The point is, we'll be more prepared. And uh, But yeah, that being said, we won't be undefeated like we were in 14 without him. But the team is just, is, is they're going to start to adjust. And I think the adjustment is going to go a little bit better than we've anticipated. I already saw Stafford last year read his progressions a little bit more, not be as dependent on Calvin because Calvin wasn't just typically, you know, the typical Calvin that you can just throw up to and he's going to catch everything and he's blown by everybody. Calvin was still good. He was still doing his thing. He was still one of the best, but he was not that freak athlete and Megatron. And so Stafford is already starting to uh, adjust to that. And I think we're going to see that uh, be a um, another adjustment and another improvement, him not relying on one guy so much, even more so in 2016. Moving on from life without Calvin, it's time for the segment Know Your Foe. Like we mentioned before, in the next three weeks, we'll be taking one of our NFC North Divisional foes. We'll be looking at uh, how they've done this offseason, some key additions, some key subtractions, talking about their outlook as a whole. We're taking the Chicago Bears this week, Next week, it'll be Green Bay and then the Minnesota Vikings. So the Bears, they went 6-10 and last year. They had a new coach in John Fox. They uh, moved to a 3-4, and they look pretty good in spots, and in some spots, they look bad. And I know that kind of sounds like the Chicago Bears of the last, I don't know, 10 seasons, with the exception here or there of some spike successful seasons. Uh, the offense uh, started to click a lot more. Jay Cutler, Adam Gase had a nice little relationship. Well, Adam Gase is no longer there, and he's one of the main guys in terms of uh, you know players and or coaches that they lost. Let's look at some of their key acquisitions to start off, though. They bring in, uh, at right tackle, Bobby Massey, who is uh, from Arizona. I like this guy. He, uh, he seemed talented. You know, he was looked at as potentially a late first-round pick. He kept falling in the draft for some reason. I remember looking at the draft board on ESPN, you know, Mel Kuyper's best available. He was there, like, in the 20s, and the next guy was way down in the 40s. He just kept slipping, kept slipping. Arizona picked him up. Um, a slow start, but he's carved himself a nice career thus far. Very solid right tackle. He was a guy that I was kind of hoping the Lions would look at and bring in, and so he's going to uh, come in help bolster that offensive line in Chicago. We all know they need it desperately. Also, they bring in Danny Trevathan. You know, this guy got paid some good money, a linebacker. He fits in that 3-4 pretty good. We know what he did with the Super Bowl champs, the Denver Broncos. So he's looking to uh, step out of the shadow of, you know, your DeMarcus Wares and your Von Millers and, you know, do his own thing. Now, you have to keep this in mind. You know, when you're playing with pro bowlers, Hall of Famers. You look at that secondary that was there in Denver. You got Malik Jackson up front. You know, where Von Miller, he had some he had some dogs, okay, that he was playing around. That sometimes helps you because the attention isn't on you. Double teams isn't on you. You're not the defender being pointed at uh, to look out for. And so now he's expected to be one of those top dogs. Will it pan out for him? Not quite sure. We have to wait and see. I feel more comfortable in Bobby Massey coming in and you know, living up to his contract than I do Danny Trevathan, okay? I hope both of them falter. I hope both of them fail. I hope neither contract is worth anything. But if I had to pick, uh, I think Massey is the safer of the two. Trevathan, not surrounded by all that talent, not surrounded by, you know, the defensive scheme that uh, really helped that Denver team. And so I can see him struggling a little bit. Maybe I'm being biased and wishful since I have a bit of disdain, displeasure, dislike, let's be honest, a bit of hate, a lot of hate for the Chicago Bears. They've also brought in Akeem Hicks. This was a guy that we were looking at, defensive end slash defensive tackle from the New Orleans, New Orleans, New England Patriots. Uh, he comes in there. It makes sense because, you know, if he signed with us, he's like the third, fourth, who knows, maybe even fifth defensive tackle. We've only brought in, re-signed slash signed, I don't know, seven defensive tackles this offseason. And so in Chicago, he has a chance to be higher on that food chain, get more reps, get a little shine. And they've also brought in Jarrell Freeman, who is a solid inside linebacker via the new, uh, I keep wanting to say New Orleans, man. What is wrong with me? Something about New Orleans, I don't know. But this guy actually played for the Indianapolis Colts. And the Colts played the New Orleans Saints in the Super Bowl. I got New Orleans in there. Anyway, I must need to head down to Louisiana. Some of their key, uh, key losses, You've got Matt Forte. 
you know, one of the best running backs in the NFL the last 10 years, a stalwart there with the Chicago Bears, just as good catching the ball as he is running. He's getting older, and the succession was there. You know, they pretty much did with Matt Forte what Matt Forte did to Thomas Jones. Thomas Jones was a really good runner for the Chicago Bears, you know, Pro Bowl caliber. They draft Matt Forte when it's time to pay Thomas Jones some more money and or keep him around. He's expendable. And so they draft Jeremy Langford last year out of Michigan State. The writing to me was on the wall for Matt Forte. They jettisoned him. He is no longer there. He is in New York doing his thing. And um, I, you, you got to like it so far. I mean, Langford could step in and be a, a bone crusher like Forte had been for us. But as of right now, you got to say Forte is the better of the two. So that's good for us. Martellus Bennett, he's gone. You know, this is a good tight end. Whether it was Dallas, whether it's, you know, I think he uh, he was with the Giants for a little bit. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then with Chicago, big body, athletic. To me, kind of like what you were hoping to get out of Brandon Pettigrew. But he actually did it. Big, physical. And uh, he's gone. So that's definitely an improvement. Shea McClellan just never lived up to that first round hype that he got being drafted in like the 20s in the first round a few years back. Never really uh, lived up to that, in my opinion. And one of the bigger subtractions is offensive coordinator Adam Gase. This was a guy that if the Lions said, uh, Jim Caldwell, you're gone, and we had the time, he probably would have been a strong consideration to be your head coach of the Detroit Lions. Well, as it turns out, Caldwell's still here. Gase was the hot name. He is currently in Miami with the Dolphins, with Ndamukong Sue down there on South Beach with all of his talents. That's a big blow for the Chicago Bears because they looked really good uh, at spots. You know, if your offense can look good with Jay Cutler, you know your coordinator is doing something right. It's the second year for John Fox. This is a solid coach. I mean, you got to give him his credit. I know a lot of people joked, laughed about him because uh, his replacement in Carolina was Ron Rivera. And then he got replaced in Denver. Lo and behold, those two teams get rid of him and they're in the Super Bowl. But no, this is a good coach. And uh, they're slowly but surely forming their uh, their 3-4 defense. Keep in mind, Kevin White, highly touted receiver, tons of speed and size, did not play last year. So whoever they draft uh, in the first round in that 10 range, you got to add Kevin White to the mix. So it's like them having two top-end first-round picks this year. Hopefully it doesn't pan out for them. But I do like the direction that they're headed. All the teams in the NFC seem to be, NFC North seem to be headed in the right direction. Packers are always going to be there. Vikings ascending. You hope the Lions are ascending. And yes, even the Chicago Bears are starting to show a little something. All right, guys, we're going to take a break. When we come back, as we do, we're going to get draft heavy. I've got three sleepers for you. And then for the question segment that we're going to close out with, it seems as though a lot of you, just like me, have the draft on your mind. So we're going to tackle all of those questions. They're draft centric. We'll be right back on the Hindsight 20. Jerry Maller here for the Hindsight 20 podcast. Your ad can be placed right here. It's simple if you want to do a little business with this show and or the Detroit Sports Podcast as a whole. Send us an email, hindsight20podcast at gmail.com. Do it. We're back on the hindsight 20. That was M83 with their uh, their newest song, Do It Try It. I like that song. It's pretty good. Like that band as a whole. It's real quick, but it's story time here on the hindsight 20. Uh, a dream of mine, you know, is to see uh, a radio head, okay? I've I've been to a lot of concerts, okay? From every genre of music. You know, when you listen when you listen to my show, any song I play is a song I own, a song I like. So you hear everything from alternative to hip hop to techno, uh, EDM, whatever it is, if you hear it on here, it's, it's a song that I like, lots of Alice in Chains, et cetera, et cetera. Been to a lot of shows and seen just about all of the acts, by and large, that I've wanted to see. But I do have, I do have one that is, uh, that is on that list I have not seen, and it's Radiohead. Brings me to my next point, tying in with M83. Uh, they're going to be playing at the Mopop Festival, which comes uh, to Detroit sometime in July. Uh, it's them... 
Oh, I can't even think of who else was performing with them. Definitely interested in seeing that one. Me and a buddy of mine, I think we're going to go down there, check those guys out. But Radiohead, they're playing at Lollapalooza. And that's another thing on my list. I want to go to one of these festivals, man. One of those big ones. I know it's a hassle and the crowds and, you know, you get, it gets very unhygienic. You know, you hear stories about fecal matter and urine and a bottle of water is 10 bucks. But I just, all that being said, I want to make it to one of these festivals. I remember being a little kid in 1990, was it four, when they did the reboot of the Woodstock? And like, man, that looks cool. And the one in 99 where they set everything on fire and threw mud at Kurt Loder, and, Kurt Loder and company. You know, I've always wanted to go to one of these. And so Lollapalooza, I go this year, it feels a need, and go in one of those festivals. And one of the headliners is, you guessed it, Radiohead. They've also got Red Hot Chili Peppers, who I've seen and who I, I would love to see again. It's a very solid lineup. Uh, I want to say M83 is going to be at that one. Uh, I don't remember all the names off the top of my head, but I do remember you know, the slate is going to be solid. And so we'll see, you know, will I live that out and be uh, the man who fulfilled his dreams? Or will I be looking at 2017 saying, eh, maybe this will be the year. There's a couple of cool concerts coming to town though this year that I want to see. Thrice, a band I really like quite a bit. They're back in action. They got a new album coming out. They're coming to the Fillmore this upcoming summer. Florence and the Machine coming to town. Uh, Smashing Pumpkins. They're coming to town this Friday. Kind of snuck up on me. I've seen them twice. Might have to make it a third time. So it's all good. Story time is over. Hopefully you stick around. If you like that type of music and that type of thing you did. If not, I apologize. Uh, tell your friend who was listening and doesn't like uh, the story time music selection to come back. Because it's time to talk the NFL draft. And what I've got for you today are uh, three sleepers. And these are guys in the fifth round-ish or later that I think would fit a need for the Lions. Maybe there's been some interest shown from the Lions. I've got three names, and all of them could be had in and around that fifth round area. Remember, we have multiple picks in the late rounds, so it would be a quality time to grab a player or two that fits that need. Now, the first one, you already know who's going to be, right? If you follow the Lions, we know they've shown a ton of interest in this guy. He's fit the need. You look on places like Fan Side, and they show how the metrics even fit with uh, you know, Bob Quinn is probably looking for in, in a defensive back. It's Justin Simmons from Boston College. 6'3", 187 pounds. He's got the size. He's got the speed. It's a position of need. Safety. You know, I'm not going to go on and on about this guy because we've we've talked about him. And, he, you know, any Detroit Lions website has gone on and on about Justin Simmons. You got to believe with the amount of interest that they've shown um, that this is a guy potentially could be brought in here you would not be surprised if at some point in the fifth round you hear his name called for detroit you know when it's a later round and you show that much interest i don't think it's a smoke screen i think there's something there to it and i think this is someone they would love to bring in and like i said he fits the need uh the three cone drill the height some of these things that are important when new england is bringing in uh, a guy he fits all those bills so if bob quinn is kind of going with that old standard it all makes sense. Now, the next guy is a running back. You know, we've got Theo Reddick. We've got Amir Abdullah. We've got Zach Zinner. That's fine and dandy. You know, we're all hoping Amir Abdullah takes that next step, like Coach Caldwell mentioned. But you still need another guy. You know, you would like to have that bruiser. Yeah, it could be Zinner. I still think we bring in someone. I've got a name for you out of Texas A&M. It's Trey Carson. This is a big boy, 5'11", 227. You know, some guys are big, but, you know, they're just big. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be tough, strong. Not the case with him. Got a chance to watch some video on him. I think I saw a game or two of Texas A&M uh, live with him playing, but I don't remember 100%. But definitely did watch some highlights and some film, uh, some of those every down packages that you get. And this would be a perfect guy uh, as a big body, a bruiser, you know, third and short, goal line situation. Perfect compliment. He's a downhill runner. And uh, he uses his size. He's got the frame. He fits the bill as a power back. And he's someone I can see the Lions looking at. Now, this next guy is someone who I really like. And uh, he's like a Jerry Mallory special. Uh, he fits a need. He kind of think in terms of uh, a guy we've looked at in Mike Neal and think in terms of a guy we just lost in Daryl Tapp. We still might bring Daryl Tapp back. Still might bring Mike Neal in. 
you know, kind of that linebacker defensive end kind of combo, more than likely a defensive end in our scheme. But if we do a little three, four, which, hey, Charles Austin might want to get creative, they can drop back. It's Steven Weatherly. He's a defensive end slash linebacker. I really like this guy. I really feel like uh, this young man will have a better college career or a pro career than he did in college. And he had a pretty solid career in college as well. Now, it's not all about measurables, but he, to me, his measurables do stand out. Now, when you're talking about a guy that's six foot four, 267 pounds, that's good. That's good size. But the size and speed that he puts with it is what is really impressive. Now, at six foot four, 267, he runs a four six one flat 40. That's pretty good. Now, if you're looking at some linebackers this year, you know, a lot of them are running in the four eights. A lot of them are running four seven fives. And the guys that are running in these four eights and four seven fives, they aren't as big as big Steven Weatherly. No, the big man, like I said, linebacker defensive end out of Vanderbilt definitely has the size and the speed, and he has good production. He had uh, nine and a half tackles for loss, two forced fumbles, three and a half sacks last year alone. And so I'm really liking the potential of someone that can fill that Daryl Tapp void, someone that can be similar to a Mike Neal. It seems though the Lions are interested in a player of that ilk, and I think he can be had in the fifth round. Steven Witherly, linebacker's last defensive end out of Vanderbilt. All right, we're going to end the show with a few questions. I want to thank all of you for uh, submitting them. If I don't get to your question this week, hold tight. Hopefully I get to you in the upcoming weeks. We'll start off with Mr. Terrence Roger. Terrence Roger 84 on Twitter. He asks, what positions would you draft for the Lions in rounds one, two, and three? Well, uh, it, it's kind of hard to, to say for sure. You know, you always go with best available, but I'm going to play the game as in there's equal talent at every position. And you're basically saying round one is most important, followed by two, then followed by three. And it's with, uh, it, it's not necessarily equal talent, you know, you got to be realistic, too, with what's available. You know, like offensive tackle would, by and by and large, be, you know, our number one need. But by 16, you know, the first two guys are definitely gone, Tunsil and Stanley. So realistically, I could say an offensive tackle, but do I want the third offensive tackle or do I want to take a risk on potentially the first or second best edge rusher in Noah Spence? You get what I'm saying? But uh, just to play the game, I'll say first, it's, it's between defensive and offensive tackle. I'm going to say defensive end. I feel like there will be a better defensive end at 16 than it will tackle. It will be close, though. Round two, I'm just going right to offensive tackle. You know, if I do tackle first round, I'm doing end second and vice versa. So I said defensive end in round one, Mr. Terrence. So round two, I'm saying offensive tackle. Round three, it really would depend up to what this team wants to do. I would love to bring in one of those hybrid slash type players, a, a dude that can play safety or a linebacker, a Mark Barron type, a Dayon Buchanan type. So Sue Cravens, who I like a lot, you know, I've been talking about him in the second round quite a bit. If a guy like him is still there. So I'm I'm going defense and I'm saying a tweener, a hybrid, a linebacker slash safety. If there isn't a hybrid there, I got to pick one of those two positions. Give me the linebacker. Thanks for the question. Now, this next one is from Chris Roberts. Uh, Chris Roberts, D-E-T, asks, what do you think of the UMass QB? They are talking about grooming. And this would be, uh, I mean, I'm probably going to say his name wrong. Was it Blaine or Fro- Fronapful? Fronapful? Something like that. Um, It's good and it's bad. And the reason I say it's good and it's bad is this. For, now, from the one end, you know, we're going to be drafting a quarterback this year. Don't know how early, you know, with us talking to a guy like him and um, us looking at a few other options. We do know that the streak is going to end. We've got Orlovsky, we've got Stafford, and for a while it's been, you know, Kellen Moore or whatever, whoever. It's going to be a drafted guy this year. I just, it's good from that standpoint. It's bad because, you know, his grooming is going to be several years, it seems like. I'd be more comfortable if we drafted someone even earlier. I'm talking, you know, move into the fourth round, you know, I won't say our third round pick, but, you know, this uh, Fronapful guy is probably like a seventh round undrafted guy. I would not be uh, I would not be upset if in the fifth round we've got multiple late round picks. We drafted a quarterback earlier. 
someone that wouldn't need as much grooming, someone that, you know, could battle Dan Orlovsky for the number two spot this year. I don't think this from Napful guy fits that bill. I don't know much about him, okay? I haven't watched film on him. You know, I saw the news piece just like when you guys did. I don't know a ton about the dude from UMass. All I do know is I don't think he would be a realistic competitor for the number two spot. I would prefer us looking at and drafting a guy that would be a legitimate competitor for the backup quarterback position. And so for me, a guy like Trevon Boykin, who you can probably still get in the sixth or seventh round, a little bit bigger school, more notoriety, albeit more polished. You know, he's got that athleticism. He brings a different dynamic. I think if you're going to go late, somebody like him is is a player that would potentially challenge Dan Orlovsky. That's what I want. You know, I didn't want us to re-sign Daniel. And so since we did, I would like us to at least bring in a guy that would challenge Daniel, not just be another Kellen Moore, someone that can, in the event that Stafford goes down, you're looking at both these guys. I don't want it to just be, oh, it's Daniel and that's all there is going to be. You know, for that glimmer of hope that that young guy could step in and challenge would be great. I don't think you get that from Fro Napful. I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong, but uh, bring in somebody, okay? If it's not from Napful, if it's not Boykin, bring in someone. I'm okay drafting someone a little bit earlier, too. We don't have to go completely bargain bin, you know, seventh round, free agent level. We've got multiple late round picks. So if you want to get a little frisky, a little dangerous, and go fifth round, I'm fine with that as well. The last question we're going to tackle today is from Brian Ballard, Goku Pantera 101 on Twitter. He asked, do we really think we can repair the offensive line in the draft? I still bet, bet excuse me, they choose D with 16. To answer that first question, no. I, I felt like, and I said it time and time again, that uh, for the offensive line this year, you sign a guy and you draft a guy. The guy you sign, I thought would be a, a fix at tackle for a couple of years. I was hoping for a guy like Joe Barksdale for right tackle, Russell Okun for left tackle, Bobby Massey or Andre Smith for right tackle. None of those happen. And so uh, there's still a chance, not a ton out there now. Ryan Clady, hey, take a chance on him. Whoever we draft, even if it's in the first round at tackle, I don't think that's the instant repair. That's the guy that's going to take time to groom no matter how you slice it. So I still want a veteran along with going after a tackle in the first two rounds. His last point, he thinks that uh, they're going to address defense in the first round. I do too. I think it's either going to be a linebacker or a defensive end. Um, I don't think any of the safeties really fit that mode where they go after one of them. Uh, Cornerback, not as likely, you know, Eli Apple, whatever, whatever. I think a defensive end or a linebacker will be addressed in the first round. And then after that, I mean, you know, like we already said, even if it is a first-round tackle, don't feel as though he would be the guy to uh, really fix or step right in and become the guy we needed in 2016 anyway. All right, guys, that's going to do it. It's been a fun show. We talked about Calvin 2.0 and Levy. Hope we're all wrong about that. Talked about knowing your foe. We know the Chicago Bears a little bit better. We know some of their additions, some of their subtractions, and you know what we can look forward to them in the next year, and we wrapped it up as always, with the draft. We'll be back next week's show. We've uh, we've talked to Mr. Chris Gandy from those Detroit Guys podcast. He'll be joining us. We might have another guest or two, maybe a surprise here or there. In any event, I'll be back at Jerry Mallory NFL is where I can be found on Twitter. I can also be found on Pride of Detroit doing podcasts and videos. And yes, right here on the Detroit Sports Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe. Until next week, I want to thank each and every one of you for listening to the Hindsight 20 Podcast.